Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, I realise that it's, uh, there is a very important sporting event uh, halfway through this session, and those English nationalists who wish to leave at 3.45... <laughs> so, that, uh, so that we Scottish and Irish can stay here and finish off the, the programme with the hopes of that, that you'll all be suffering from depression at the end of uh, that particular event. Um, the title for this is Is the Long Depression Over? which as you know, or some of you may, uh, about three, two years ago, well actually it seems to have took longer than that, uh, I read a book called The Long Depression in which I argued that at the, after the end of the Great Depression we seem to enter a Great Recession, we seem to enter a period of very low growth, uh, depressed environment similar to the 1930s. Um, also in that uh, book, I made a forecast that this would uh, come to an end, and it could only really be end by, ended by a, a series of slumps, and probably a, a severe slump, which I predicted would be during 2018. Um, last year, when I gave this uh, session something similar to this, I made the firm prediction that we would have the slump by the time we got to this meeting here in July 2018, and if that wasn't the case, I wouldn't be turning up. <laughs> Unfortunately, I have been dragooned to come and present this session to you and explain how I got everything so terribly wrong. <laughs> so let us start with this uh, mess. Um, first of all, here is the latest... Because there's going to be loads of graphs, those of you who haven't been to this session before. But bear with me, my sister used to say, I used to like coming to your sessions, but there's too many graphs, can't follow the graphs. But you'll have to do that with me. This looks complicated, but basically this is a graph put in the Financial Times this week by Gavin Davis, who used to be the chief economist of Goldman Sachs. And after making his tens of millions, he, be he set up his own forecasting company, which uh, gets paid by the FT every so often to present its forecasts of what's happening to the world economy. And in the red line tells you where, as far as that company is concerned, Gavin Davis's company is concerned, where the world economy is at the moment, how fast it's growing. And as you can see, the red line is now around about just over 4% a year, which is pretty good uh, compared to the past, because if you go back to 2014, it was under 4%, and you can see Basically, it slipped. This is the world economy, not Britain, not America, not the advanced economies, the whole lot together, uh, was dropping down to a growth rate of 2.5%, which I can tell you, if you're at that level, given the level of population growth and the countries involved, that's virtually no growth at all per head. It means virtually a recession. But it's been picking up since uh, January 16, since Michael Roberts made the prediction of the uh, slump in 2018. It's been picking up. And we're now into a 4% growth rate, according to um, Gavin Davis. Um, so if we look at global business activity, global business activity, how is that measured? Well, uh, a bunch of uh, companies, a company goes in and it asks loads of chief executives around the world in different companies, how are things going? Are you feeling good? Are you feeling bad? Think things are picking up or not? Uh, so they make a survey of, of of executives and they come up with a conclusion of whether the activity of the company is picking up and they aggregate that all together and come up with an answer. And anything over 50 means that the economies are expanding. The econ this is the global economy. So as you can see, at the beginning of 2016, basically the global economy was hardly expanding according to this survey. It's just above 50. Now it's picked up back to 54, looking promising. So. Again, compare, if we're up to the sort of levels we had after the Great Recession in 2014, 52, 53, 54. This is not dramatically strong, but it's picked up from the depth of 2016. So, global recession, or the long depression, uh, may appear to be over. But before we answer that question, let's just remember how bad the Great Recession was in 2008. Now, I cannot emphasize this enough that the loss of production, the loss of employment, the loss of people's living standards in the period between 2008-9 was tremendous, and it's gone 
forever. It doesn't matter how much growth takes place since, that's gone. Just think, capitalism every so often has regular crises which wipes out people's jobs, millions of people's jobs, maybe they lose their homes, uh, they lose a lot of money, they, their children can't do this, that, and the other, and it's very difficult to re-establish the position. It could take years. In the case of this period, since 2008-9, most people's living standards, the majority of people's living standards, have hardly got back to where they were before the slump of 2008-9. So 10, 12 years, some cases worse, that it's gone forever. So where, where things are going forward in 2007, then they dropped away, they haven't really, they can't come back. It's all been lost forever. And this goes on regularly under capitalism. And 2008 was particularly bad. Uh, we had, in the, it says here, for example, at the trough of the Great Recession, industrial production was down 13%. The overall economy in the major economies is down 6% from the previous peak level. And world trade was down 20%. And of course, the one thing that we're not particularly worried about was that stock markets were down 50%. But don't worry, stock markets have recovered much better than wages, employment, and the economy. And that's the important thing, isn't it? Here is the uh, relative loss of national income during the Great Recession, 2008-09. What that means is, if the economies had gone on as they were going before, and where they actually went on, the difference between the two, where the trend was and where, what actually happened. So, uh, up here, Germany lost 5% of GDP forever. Fra Japan, so on down. UK lost nearly 19% of potential GDP if it carried on before, forever. That's not been restored. Can't be restored. And we can see, in course, of the case of Greece and Ireland, the production that was lost during that uh, Great Recession was huge. Now, uh, here's a most important graph, given that this week, uh, President Donald Trump announced yet another range of tariffs on world trade, trade between the US and other countries, Europe and China, and the retaliation that's taking place. In the Great Recession, world trade just stumped. It just, that is the potential growth that should have continued in world trade, the dotted line, the pre-crisis trend, but actually this is world trade to GDP, how much trade plays a role in every country's output, just flattened off completely. A huge gap there, it's not recovered. So if we're talking about globalization as being defined by the expansion of world trade around uh, in, in all parts of the world, then globalization is over. Just looking at that graph, the, the expansion of world trade as a way forward for all countries. It's disappeared. Uh, this is out, taken out of my um, book, The Long Depression. I just want to emphasize why I think it's a long depression. On the top line, it's, it's, a, it's a schematic view of the difference between a recession, an ordinary slump, an ordinary slump, just a common or garden slump where everybody loses their jobs and then they, it all goes back again. It's like a V-shape. 1974-5 was the first international, uh, glo uh, international recession in the post-war period. And that's the uh, schematic form that it took. It was like a V. Went down, came back, and then trend growth continued. In 1988-2, we had a double dip, it was a W, then trend growth continued. Depression, in my view, can schematically look like that. It comes down, but it can't recovers, but the trend growth never returns to the previous trend growth. You get in like a square root, if you remember, basic uh, school arithmetic. Uh, and that's what we've experienced. In the 19, uh, there have been three periods like that, three depressions in, 19, in the 80, late 19th century, from 1873 to the 1880s, depending on which country. It went down, recovery never went back to trend growth. The Great Depression never went back to trend growth until the beginning of the world, Second World War when it was restored. And in the current position, although it goes up to 2012, it's still the case that trend growth, which on average is about 3.5% in the world, maybe 4%, we haven't gone back, although Gavin Zavis says we're nearly there, for the last 10 years. We haven't returned to that trend growth. So that's one of my definitions of what I consider as a long depression. If we could like to compare, see if we can follow this graph, we're going to compare what the recovery in the Great Depression of the 1930s with the current long depression, as I call it. So in the Great Depression, when it took place in 1929, which is the red line, it fell 17.5% from 1930 to 1929. 
from its trend. Massive drop, and then it gradually recovered. Well, it, it, it quite covered at quite a pace. So after about 10 or 11 years, it was well above where it was before. And in fact, it crossed the line of returning to the previous level of GDP after seven or eight years. So if you work that out, 1929, by 1937-38, world production in the major economies, G7 economies, was the same as it was in 1929. And then it carried on up, particularly in the war period. What has happened this time? We had a smaller fall, but the recovery has been really weak. And in fact, here we are 10 years later, in 2018, and basically the world economy has recovered to about the same level as it did in the 1930s. And the trend is much slower. If we go on like this, then the loss will be much more severe, or the recovery will be much weaker than it even was in the Great Depression of the 1930s. Of course, what happened in the Great Depression of the 1930s was the Second World War, which dramatically changed at the picture. Now, uh, there's a famous story, which I'll have to repeat. Mainstream economics, of course, couldn't explain what the hell, why this Great Recession never took place, and why things are, no, are very slow. And the famous one is when the Queen turned up at the London School of Economics down the road in July 2009, right at the depth of the recession, and she was uh, greeted by the dignitaries of the British Academy, who were there, flunking in this manner. Uh, <laughs> And uh, she said, why did it happen? <laughs> why did it happen? And uh, they said, what, what? They had, uh, I'll tell you what, Madam Queenie, we will, we will send you a reply in a letter. This is their reply. Your Majesty, the failure to foresee the timing, extent, and severity of the crisis, and to head it off, while it had many causes, was principally a failure of the collective imagination of many bright people, both in this country and internationally, to understand the risks of the system as a whole. In other words, we haven't got an effing idea. <laughs> Your Majesty. The leading economists of the world, who still sit in the universities of Chicago and Harvard and elsewhere, also had a view in the early 2000s when things were booming along. This is what the Nobel Prize winner Robert Lucas said in 2003. The central problem of depression, de prevention, has been solved. There is no problem in capitalism anymore. And uh, leading Keynesian Olivier Blanchard, who was the chief economist at the IMF, said in 2008, the state of macro is good. Macro is... Uh, academic word for looking at the whole economy, macroeconomics. So he said, the state of our understanding of the world economy and macroeconomics is good. 2008. Right, it's already started. Now, this is my best one, though. Eugene Farmer, who, has a, who won a Nobel Prize for explaining that stock markets are extremely efficient in allocating resources. And if they go up or down, they have a very good reason for going up or down. I don't know what it is, but if they go down, it's fine. And if they go up, it's fine. Nobel Prize, please. <laughs> it's called the efficient Marxist, um, Marxist, efficient markets hypothesis. It's very efficient for him, anyway. We don't know what causes recession, said Eugene. I'm not a macroeconomist, so I don't feel very bad about that. <laughs> We've never known. Debates go on to this day about what caused the Great Depression. Economics is not very good at explaining swings in economic activity. <laughs> if I could have predicted the crisis, I would have. I don't see it. I'd love to know more about what causes business cycles. <laughs> now, you, the, these, are, these are the paragons of, and leadership of uh, modern macroeconomics. <laughs> the main alternative view is that of the Keynesians, who said the Great Recession and the crisis was a complete collapse in demand. Now, I have to say I agree entirely with the Keynesians, because when we had a Great Recession, there was no demand. You couldn't afford to buy anything, and the capitalists couldn't afford to invest anything. 
So there was a collapse of demand. So it, I see that as a definition of a slump. Not a cause of it, but it's a definition. So what was the cause? Well, according to the Keynesians, it was a breakdown of animal spirits. The phrase that Keynes uses always worried me a bit. Uh, animal spirits, uh, uh, or more than that, but apparently we're animals and we're really subject to totally irrational behaviour uh, and we're either overconfident or we're depressed. Uh, and why we swing from overconfidence to depression is not explained, it just happens. It's unpredictable and you just have to recognise it. So capitalists were very, very confident, like Robert Lucas, the state of macro is good, depression, depression is... Depression is there, everything's confident, boom, 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 and suddenly it's depression. Everybody's changed their psychology. Suddenly you've had too many PIMs like me, and you've suddenly gone depressed, because alcohol is a depressant. And so you get booming with alcohol, and then you have the hangover. But no explanation of why this goes from one to the other. It just happens. So it's animal spirits. Uh, at the moment... People don't have much animal spirit, although, according to Gavin Davis, it's getting a bit better. Um, Minsky was a radical follower of, of Keynes, and he said it's an inherent financial stability. In other words, the financial sector is totally unstable all the time. It's speculating, it's not investing in, in reality, uh, the, the bankers are engaged in all kinds of reckless activity, they're always looking to borrow to make more money, and then they over-borrow and then the whole thing collapses. Well, you can see there's an element of truth in that argument again, but you have to, again, I have to ask myself, why is things fine for 10 years and then suddenly they're not fine and goes down? Is there something else involved in the process of causing this collapse? The main one used by... Uh, most uh, on the left, maybe, is banking deregulation and reckless speculation. Well, we recognise the financial sector is reckless. It's out of control. The banks are not a public service. They're a uh, hedge fund, asset fund, uh, speculative activity for rich people to try and make more profit through financial speculation rather than through investment and expanding value. And that's clearly a factor involved. As Warren Buffett, the, the world's greatest investor said it was banking was engaged in financial weapons of mass destruction, as he said, and that's uh, an indicate, and that's clearly part of the process. But again, why does expansion of credit, uh, carrying out buying and selling in the stock market, suddenly look is good, and then suddenly it's no longer good? Why does one swing to the other? Well, there's no explanation from even the Keynesians are on the left. This is, of course, what I think is the fundamental cause, that what matters to capitalism is making a profit. Production is for profit. It's a capitalist system is production for profit. Profitability of the overall capitalist system, therefore, is the very good indicator of which way capitalism is going. This graph shows that, overall, there's a downward trend in capitalism over a very long period. This is a figure for the world, 14 countries put together, by, as I always like to mention, Esteban Maito, an Argentine economist who works in the finance department of the Argentine finance department, uh, finance ministry. Of course, obviously, he's not spending his time doing this in his daytime work, but hidden in the vaults of the ministry, in the dark light with a candle, he's producing this uh, research uh, which he makes available to me, so I can popularise it and take the credit for it. And, <laughs> and uh, here is his results, looking at 14 countries. I won't go into how you do that. If you want to argue with us Marxist economists on how you produce a rate of profit figure, then we can also do that. But what I would say at this point is, I think you should accept without any scepticism that this graph is correct. And you will see that general downturn here, but the point I'm making here is that it's not always down. There are periods when there are recoveries, particularly in the war, but also if uh, a whole series of slumps take place and it creates the conditions for a rising rate of profit. But if we come to the very end period here, if you, this is mostly to do with our lifetime, uh, if you take the period from the early 1980s to now, which is what we call in the academic circles, I don't like this word, but the neoliberal period, basically when uh, capitalism tries to drive down uh, workers' conditions and wages, privatise the public sector, 
uh, open and deregulate the banking, open up uh, world trade to uh, free flow of capital, and in this way to try and raise the rate of profit, which had been falling dramatically, as you can see, between the 1960s and the early 1980s, and to create conditions for an expansion of the rate of profit, and therefore the uh, development of capitalism on a new scale. Well, neoliberalism achieved that at the tremendous expense of labor conditions, the public services, and all the things that you know about and are well aware of and probably fought against over the last 10 or 15 years. But how much did they achieve? Well, not very much. All that pain that we've had to put up with has raised the rate of profit on this graph from, say, 20% to 22%. It stopped it falling. Not very much, but... It, but we see from the early 2000s, we begin to see a decline again in the rate of profit. And so I'm arguing that the Great Recession was a culmination of banking recklessness, of uh, speculation, of excessive credit being expanded. And the reason that was because, because profitability was falling. And fundamentally, profitability fell to a point where it was no longer profitable for the weaker sections, particularly in the mortgage sections of... Uh, the US housing market at the time, to continue. And then we saw a collapse in profits, and then the collapse in investment, employment, and income. The Keynesian position is income, uh, people stop spending, so then uh, uh, there's the, the workers have, there's, there's less capitalist in, investment, and therefore there's less employment. No, we'll say it the other way around. Profits stop, start falling, investment starts falling, investment falls, and then people stop spending. You'll spend as long as you've got a job, but if your job goes, you'll stop spending. It's not that way around, but profitability is what matters. And the other thing that matters is rising debt. Here's a figure which shows you the um, position globally, latest figure. You can see that uh, on the left-hand side, those companies which are not financial companies, are banks, have seen an increase. The black block is 1997. So there was 21 trillions worth of debt held by companies globally that were not banks in 1997. Then the purple line says it's 43 trillion in 2007 when the crisis begins. And here we are in 2016 or 2017, it's 70 trillion. So despite the slump of 2008, which is supposed to have wiped out a load of companies and banks and so on, in this case just companies, the debt held by companies around the world has increased, not fallen, in absolute figures. The same applies to government in particular, because as we know, governments bailed out all the banks, and they took a lot of the debt of the banks that existed and put it on their books. So we can see in, nine, in 2007, there was 35 trillions worth of government debt, and now there is 64 trillion. It's more than, just about doubled in, the last, uh, in that period since 2007. And household debt has also risen, particularly risen before the slump, and since then has risen a bit more. And then the financial sector, which we expect to have uh, slumped considerably, it reached massive 54 trillion, and it's more or less stayed there, but it's still not fallen. So debt has risen dramatically before the slump, along with falling profitability, so the two things went together. And since the slump and the long depression, debt has not come down, it's gone up. Uh, as a percentage of GDP, we can even see that more clearly. In 1997, uh, total debt in the cap major capitalist economies, that's mature, the purple one, was 266% of production, annual production by those mature companies. Now it's 382%. So the debt is dramatically increasing relative to the expansion of the economies in the, in the major economies. So major economies have grown a little bit. Their debt has rocketed up. So they're in worse position than they were in 2007. And on the basis of that, the IMF projects, projects that from 2008, the global growth rate, in the, well, the G7 growth rate in the top companies, which is around about 2% a year since the end of the Great Recession, will actually slow down towards 2022. So on that basis, contrary to Gavin Davies' hopes, we could expect actually a slowdown in global growth, not an improvement in global growth. And that's assuming no slump at all. That's just assuming things trundle along as they are now. And the financial bubble is continually building up. We had the dot-com bubble, this is the stock market, uh, relative to how much people can spend. The dot-com bubble in, in, two, in 2000 
saw a dramatic collapse in the stock markets, then it recovered. Then we had the Great Recession housing bubble crash down to 2009. And now you can see the level of financial assets relative to the ability to be able to buy these things. I mean, obviously, not most of us don't buy these assets. Only rich people do. But the bubble is huge. It's now closer to 550% of disposable income. So the, the, the speculation in the stock market has not declined since the, it fell, but now it's completely recovered. So it's sitting there like a house of cards at the top with huge debt and with profitability still not really picking up around the world. So what are companies doing with the money that they've been making? Because we're told every day they're making huge profits. What have they been doing is they've not been investing productively. They've been, off, they've been driving up the stock market price by buying back their shares. This is the top 500 companies in the United States, called the S&P 500. And they've been, what have they been doing with all the cash they've got? Been buying back their shares or giving it in dividends to their shareholders. How much have they spent on research and development and capital spending? Well, you can see that's the two bottom blocks, the dark blue one and the light blue one. That's the productive spending. And the rest of them are unproductive spending. So they've not really been investing in the real economy. They've just been trying to drive up the stock price of their companies to make them look better. And here's a good example of that. This is the US gross spending. So that's how much, in cash terms, looks good, going up in a blue line. But when you take out all the depreciation, machines getting old, factories getting old, having to be replaced, whatever it is, having to be replaced, the net growth, the net growth is no better than it was at the beginning of this century. There's been no, the big, huge slump in the Great Recession, back to where they were before. So the net growth, in the net amount being invested in new investment, new stock, new machinery, new computers, new technology, is nearly not improving at all, despite this thing. And, we're coming up to a peak now in the amount of debt that the economies of the so-called emerging economies like Brazil, India, uh, most of Latin America, Asia, and so on, all those countries, that their debt is actually the, how much they've got to pay back because it's maturing in the next year or so is reaching a peak. Yeah, they can borrow some more money to do so, but each time it's going to be more expensive because interest rates are rising. So there's a danger now that this huge debt, particularly in the emerging economies, will not be paid for except by increased costs and increased servicing costs. And if profits aren't rising, they could be squeezed to death and we could see some crisis ahead. So as you can see, I'm drifting towards the argument of arguing that it is going to happen, honest, <laughs> bef uh, even if not in 2018, but soon, uh, and that the, the trends are in that direction. And as I said before, this is uh, a good one, I think. It's President Trump su uh, has successfully decided to close down all trade by increasing the tariffs and other measures, just at a time when all trade is falling away anyway. Uh, and uh, you can see from the end of the Great Recession, there was a slump, and now basically trade, the amount of goods and services exported and imported relative to each country's GDP, that's on the world scale, the world GDP, you see how globalization was so strong from 1990, the end of the Cold War, China joins the World Trade Organization. That's globalization expressed in the graph. But since the end of the Great Recession, it's completely collapsed. And now, uh, according to uh, Paul Krugman from the Keynesian Economist, if Trump's measures are retaliated in full force and he carries through everything, that figure, which is around about 55, 56, is likely to fall to 40. So you could see that trade will no, be no escape for national economies if they've got problems with profitability and investment and growth themselves. I'm thinking in particular of uh, the wonderful decision of the British ruling class that they've made over the past period um, in uh, leaving the EU. From their point of view, it's a disaster. Uh, and that uh, with trade tightening up, I can see all those uh, trade deals that uh, Mrs. May is going to be able to make with the countries around the world that will help to boost exports once we leave the European Union. Fantastically brilliant success. Um, but the US too struggle, will struggle. If its profit from op foreign operations falls, which is an important part of, of, of the US in foreign investment, which it will do under this, this trade war that is now developing, then they could be in trouble too. And who is gaining from all this? Well, here is China's, the red line is China's 
exports to the US. The blue line is China's exports to everybody else, particularly in Central Asia and Europe. And you can see that the switch that China is making in that direction is to sh shift the whole of the trade trends in the direction of Europe and Asia, particularly Central Asia, and away from the US because of the Trump's policy. And anyway, that's their intention in order to grab a bigger share of the world market. Uh, Trump is now proposing a Fair and Reciprocal Tariff Act, or FART. <laughs> the FART Act would allow the US president to raise tariffs at will. And as we know, he does a lot of things at will. Um, and so he wouldn't have to go to Congress. He could just say, right now, OK, 50% on the UK, 25% past the PIMS, 25% on uh, Latin America. Whatever, it's all up to him if this act goes through. As, as Anthony Scaramucci, who I'm sure if you ever remember meeting him as the communications director for Trump, he lasted a week, I think. Uh, he was a very interesting, spivvy-looking character. But anyway, he's tweeted that the bill stinks. So fart stinks, uh, according to him. And that's another indication of the way, the direction that Trump is going in this. Uh, so we're still in the long depression, in my view. It hasn't come out, and if we look at we can see short-term swings within this period since 2008-9. There was a recovery from 2008-9 to 11, then it went down from 2011 to 13. If you read my book, I explain why there are short-term cycles. Then there's a swing up in 2013-15, and then we had quite a severe downward period from 2015-17 when the recession looked probable, but we've had a bit of a recovery from 2017-18, so here is my new prediction <laughs> that we will end, we're peaking <laughs> this quarter, which will be announced next week in the US, will be a good one. It'll look good on the whole, quite strong. Uh, but I think that's getting close to the peak. And as we go through 29 into 2020, I think we're going to head down, and that's when we could be back in the slump period. So I've uh, done a real change in real GDP in the advanced countries, and you can see. I'm trying to suggest that we've got these sort of uh, short-term swings in the process. And the trend is around about 3% uh, growth rate per capita over a two-year period, which means 1.5% a year. So one, every year, the advanced countries, which currently includes the UK, just, um, is growing at 1.5% a year per head of population. That's what it's been doing. Uh, and when it drops below that trend, you have a sort of close to depression. So in 2011-13, it was growing at under 1% a year per person. It was hardly growing at all, and the IMF forecast is it will decline back. So we're going to go back this particular boost in the economy, which is taking place since the middle of 2017 to now, the middle of 2018, which has seen world growth rise from about 3%, world growth rise to just about three and a half, and head, possibly heading to four, is, I think, the peak of this particular short-term cycle, and then things will swing down after that. This is the latest figure for world manufacturing activity, which um, I'm relying on to suggest, at least in the productive sectors of the world, the economies are not looking so great. As you remember, it's got to be over 50 to have expansion. Here, it's just above 50, and it's come way down uh, from 2014 when it was, well, way down, 52, 53, not very high, but it's coming down. Manufacturing really has not been expanding very much. And this, perhaps, the most one of the most important graphs for me is global profits, corporate profits globally around the world. And you can see from 1997, there's a trend there, then we get the credit boom, then we get the Great Recession, and then we get the recovery. This is year-on-year -year growth, and you can see in the Long Depression, it really, corporate, corporate growth has not been very good corporate, global profit growth. Not just the US figures you read in the FT about Amazon. Everybody in the major economies, the global corporate profit growth has really been around about 10% in cash in nominal terms, and it actually went negative in that 15 period, recovered, and it's pretty well low at the moment. It's negative, actually, at the moment. I mean, another sign that things could slow down. And finally, Chair, Finally, Chair, the last graph, and this is really explanatory to all of you, isn't it? A negative yield curve. You got that? All right, I won't explain it. Oh, no. Okay, so apparently, 
some economists have found that if you measure the interest that's being charged on a bond that's, ten years, that's a 10-year-old bond that the government, governments of the world issue, that's quite a common bond, if you measure the interest rate of that against whatever the short-term rate is that the central bank, the Bank of England or the Federal Bank has set, if that goes negative, so either the interest rate of the 10-year bond comes down and goes below the Federal Reserve or the Bank of England rate, or the Bank of England and Federal Reserve rate rises and eventually passes the 10-year rate. Whenever that happens, every time, every time, there's a recession in a year. Now, uh, I will explain why I think that might be true, but currently you can see that it's not negative. You can see the little arrows, that's when it was negative, and every time there was a recession, those little shadow lines is the recession. So, either, what's happening at the moment? Well, the Federal Reserve and the Bank, the Bank of England and other countries are raising rates at the short end. What's happening at the long end, as we like to call it? Um, well, it's actually reasonably high in most places. It's not falling much. But, so that gap is narrowing, but mainly because central banks are raising interest rates because they think the crisis is over and they think they can raise the interest rates. The only reason the long-term bond would fall is if people felt that the world was coming to an end or things were slowing down and they should buy bonds rather than stocks or they shouldn't invest, they should just hold their money in a nice safe cash. If you think of your own savings, which I'm sure you've got millions, uh, but if you do, you might buy a national savings certificate, which being very safe, that's like buying the bond. Or you might buy an ISA, which is like buying a corporate bond. But otherwise, you'd be driving down the top end of that curve while the interest rates are rising at the bottom end because of the central bank. So here's a finisher. If that goes negative, see you next year. Okay, uh, the, my, my, I want to start really with, quickly with a question to Michael, which is about prediction. I, I, I'm a bit uncomfortable as a Marxist being in the game of prediction. It doesn't <laughs> seem to me what we're doing. I, I mean, I remember, you know, as a young comrade recognising that capitalism has crises and having a sort of rule of thumb, sort of, say roughly every 10 years was the idea. And then... We had a crash in 1981, which was terrible. A third of all the manufacturing in Manchester disappeared in 18 months. Then in 1991, there was another bout of huge wipeout of white-collar jobs, a horrible moment. So 2001, you were kind of expecting something. There was a dot-com boom and bust, but it was mainly in the States. And after that, you couldn't, say, you couldn't really say we had one in Britain. And then 2003, 5, 7, no, sorry, 2003, 5, you were beginning to worry about whether or not this 10-year rule applied, so you stopped predicting the crash. And my explanation of being caught out in 2007 is, is now, I, I use what I call the elastic band theory, which is basically, you shouldn't put a figure on it. What you should do is say that the longer it is since the last crash, the bigger the next one will be. And that seems to me to fit what happened in 2007. I'd like to know what you think. The other thing about the unpredictability of it is over the years talking economics with comrades, I've talked about what I call the Bugs Bunny effect. You remember in the cartoons, Bugs Bunny walks off the cliff and sometimes he walks just one or two steps and sometimes he does eight or ten. It's just a question of almost round. When does he look, when does he, when does he look down and realise there's nothing there? It's a, it's a kind of random moment when, when suddenly yeah. the confidence goes. I mean, we are in a situation where it seems to me, and I'd like you to correct me if I'm wrong here, that all the talk about how they were going to reform the system, they were going to control bankers' bonuses, they were going to separate investment banking from consumer banking, all of this is just so much baloney. You know, the obscene levels of, consumer, uh, of uh, bankers' bonuses is more or less back where it was. You know, has anything really changed since the, the 2007 crash? Thank you, comrade. If anybody else wants to put their hands up, I'm just going to take the mic to someone who wants to speak. I'll take you afterwards. Thank you very much, Michael. That was incredibly informative and very useful. I have a question about the response. Um, 
in this country in 2000, can you hear me? Yep. 2008, Gordon Brown instituted quantitative easing. Um, and one set of arguments that resulted in um, a lot of increase in the price of assets. And what happened is, and affected all of us, housing became incredibly expensive. Mm -hmm. And housing is one of the chief indicators of inequality in this country. Yeah. And it's, according to Danny Dawling, we've got peak inequality at the moment. Now, another political economist, Anne Pettifor, said they could have done it differently. They didn't need to put quantitative easing money into the financial institutions. Yeah. What they could have done using quantitative easing was buy or invest on assets, i.e. we could invest in more hospitals, we could invest in more in schools, we could invest in more in transport and so on. And her argument is that's what should happen. Now my question is, is she right? Is it just a question of political choice? And in, the, in that case, we should just bloody well rouse ourselves and everyone else and actually insist on Corbyn, a Corbyn government following that path and actually announcing it now. Thank you. Thank you, comrade. Um, there was somebody just here wanted to come up. Do you want to come up? Hi. Um, I have a question, really, only. Um, in, in the figure that you showed for the decrease in the profit rate, can you hear me now? Yeah. Great. Um, the decrease in profit rate, there was one discernible pattern that it went up every time there was a big war happening. And I would like to know um, something about that, whether, um, and especially in relation to Trump's insistence on increased military expenditure and Macron's attempts to build a European army. How, because, I mean, if it always goes up again, that might be an option for them, couldn't it? Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's a comrade here, and then there's somebody else at the back just there. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Baba Aye from the Socialist Workers League Nigeria. Uh, it's a pleasure. I, I found Michael's book, The Great Recession, immediately uh, in the wake of that recession, very useful in understanding uh, things, and I've been following uh, the next uh, recession uh, block since then. I, I, I have two questions, um, so to speak. Uh, First, um, really, from, from what you have said, there's a seminal, I mean, depression. And is the question about is the long depression over or are we in for another recession? Because uh, that's, that's one. Then, then the second one, I, I think it's not accidental that uh, the 1880s scramble for uh, Africa, Berlin Wall and all that jazz, uh, was during that long depression. Uh, uh, when, when the Great Recession started, there was this illusion in a number of um, central bank governors in Africa that it wasn't going to hit us. It was slow motion in coming, but the shit did hit the fan. Uh, but subsequently, you have had this new scramble for Africa, so to speak. You, you have had um, several World Economic Forum sessions on Africa. Uh, you have had uh, Africa being touted as where they have the highest uh, returns on investment and so on and so forth. Uh, I mean, looking generally, uh, of course, uh, the truth is always concrete and there are specificities to this, but within the logic of uh, uh, the accumulation of capital uh, perspective of um, Luxembourg, for example, it, it, which link in this whole chain of uh, inherently crisis-laden uh, economic situation would you uh, put such, uh, such efforts, both of Chinese capital and Western capital, uh, within the dynamic of things right now? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, come right there. And I think there's a comrade at the back who's put their hands up. Yeah, if you wanted to move, come up to the front as well. 
Hi, I'm uh, going to be cheeky because I've got four questions, um, <laughs> Michael. Yeah, yeah, but they'll be quick. Um, I'm a journalist, so I have to attend industry conferences, and I heard the head of the investment strategy for Barclays uh, give, a, give the most upbeat economic presentation I've ever heard, basically claiming that the historic, yeah, historic highs in the stock market are a reflection of profitability, nothing to do with quantitative easing, nothing to do with historically low, you know, unprecedented low interest rates, fueling a binge and all the rest of it, and basically told business leaders, um, don't listen to forecasts of a depression, it's bad for your business. So what, what fuels that supreme confidence and what purpose, if any, does it serve for, for the capitalist class? Is it just keep on dancing till the music stops? You know, is that what they're saying? Second, what do you say about the productivity conundrum that so troubles, you know, mainstream stream economists, the fact that productivity rates are, uh, have, uh, are, are flat and, and so on, even with the investment that is taking place in, in, in technology. Related to that is the, are the technological changes coming now with artificial intelligence and robotics. Do they, will they mean a, a shift? Because for, for perhaps the first time uh, in, on a global scale, jobs will be elim being eliminated on a scale that they're not being replaced. So, for example, the Bank of England predicts 15 million jobs could go in the UK by the mid-2020s, uh, half the workforce, in, in other words. And, what, and given our, you know, the labour theory of value, what does that say for the profitability of, uh, of, 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 of capitalism? And the final thing, after, after the final question, after the 2008-2009, China proved the locomotive of the global economy um, and pulled things along. What's the situation in, in, in China? Because the Chinese are clearly terrified of a, of a, 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 a banking crisis in, in China. Just a few little questions there. Hey? <laughs> um, yeah, I'm so fine. Got another half hour. hour. I need half an hour. Some more. <laughs> um, I have a, a, probably a stupid question. It's just, you know, economics, the study of human behavior as if feelings didn't happen. <laughs> the, the anger that people have yeah. is going to play a part in this. As Charlie said at the last meeting, we are in a time of crisis and a time of, of urgency. Meanwhile, my, my sort of economics question is, that estimated nine trillion dollars that is hived away from the whole of the world economy mm -hmm. by the world's super rich and has meant that the working people of the Western world have not seen an increase in their wage income for 40 years, longer than two world wars and a depression. A few people, a lot of people have been raised out of abject poverty in the last little while, but my generation are, are are saved from, cushioned from this. You know, thanks to the way they fucked everything up, anyone who owned a house 12 years ago is sitting on a small fortune. My, my children in their 40s have homes worth a million pounds. My stepchildren in their 30s can't afford to pay the rent. There is something utterly unbalanced about this in, in emotional terms. I mean, it, it, it chews me up for a start to see this difference in my own family. And then you put this worldwide. Now, do people care that there are more and more people in food banks, that people are dying in the streets when they, when they are homeless? Well, in a sense, they do. But it doesn't make an impact on them. I mean, recently, apparently, the Times newspaper has had a lot of letters going in about something that's now enraged them. Never mind the drowning refugees, never mind all those other things. The potholes aren't being repaired because the councils don't have enough money, and therefore our nice cars are having their axles broken. Yep. And something should be done. And the Tory party has now started to say, oh, well, oh, we might find a bit of money to put in the NHS and a bit in there. And there. I mean, that anger is going to impact on them one way or another. And I have seen it impacting in a way that leads to right wing thinking. I met somebody at this conference who said, I've run out of sympathy. I think benefit claimants should pay, their pay tax on their benefits. I'm not willing to subsidise these people anymore. Someone at this conference said that to me yesterday. That's what I hear all the time in Tory shires of Britain. 
And we really have to get hold of this anger and make sure we direct it one way. But my question is, what is the impact of, I believe it's $9 trillion that have just been hidden away, stashed away by the super rich, as if they can move to another planet with it. Is that what will cause the, the big slump? I don't know. I, I don't really understand it, but I know about the feeling. We have got time for a couple more contributions. It'd be nice to see some women speaking, actually. <laughs> Has anybody else got any questions? Or The comrade who raised uh, Anne Pettifer's alternative to quantitative easing uh, raises a very important point in, in my view. Uh, we rightly, and Michael is in the forefront of this, have a critique of Keynesianism, but there's a danger of being ultra-left on the on the issue. There's been a consensus that somehow you can't put the subsidies in to keep industries alive, which are the means by which people are employed in certain parts of the country, that there isn't the money to fund the hospitals and so forth because you require austerity. The only bailouts that you can have in society are the ones for the bankers, when the banks go belly up after their, after their speculations. And we have to welcome the idea that a government might come in in this country which tries to do things differently. I absolutely welcome that unconditionally. But we also have to say that isn't going to be enough. What's been happening actually over the last few years, and Michael demonstrates it very well from his graphs, is that there's been a kind of Keynesianism going on through the growth of debt, which has stopped the world economy collapsing or, getting, or being in more crisis than it has. You've seen it in businesses, you've seen it in households, as you've also seen public sector debt growing to the point where, actually, they're reaching limits as to how far this can carry on. Debt's fine, so long as the debt stimulates growth and profitability, which is what stimulates growth, then you can pay back on the debt. If the debt doesn't create that, the debts go on getting bigger, and sooner or later, you'll then have a catastrophic collapse. Now, I, I agree absolutely with Jeff. Let's not get into the area of prediction, but everything that Michael has shown us here in great detail says that the system remains in deep, deep problems, which means that the austerity attacks will carry on, that they're going to have difficulties themselves. In, in China, which has been the motor of growth, the central bank there is now worrying about a Minsky moment coming. They don't use Marxist economics in China. They use Western economics. They think they're uh, running into problems in their banking sector through that. So the system remains in deep problems. The pressure on our class is going to continue, but also the pressure for eruptions to come the other way also continues. Um, my question is really, how does Greece um, fit into the, your perfect presentation? Because we all remember, like two weeks ago, um, the Greek finance minister, the European Commission, and all these fine economists and politicians came out and said that the, the crisis in, 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 in Greece um, is over. I mean, Alexis Tsipras um, put the tie on his suit for the, for the first time. And so, um, and really, when, when we think what um, austerity and neoliberalism did to Greece, I mean, this is devastating. Um, hundreds, um, thousands of young people had to leave the country. I mean, 40% um, uh, of the people cannot afford to pay their bills, um, to pay their rent. 40% um, um, of the people are threatened with poverty. And then um, they are presenting neoliberalism and austerity as the kind of way out of the, um, 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 the crisis. Um, what we could expect it is that they present this as the way out and put more austerity, more neoliberalism um, into the, um, this situation of, of the, um, the ec ec economy. And so I would like you to comment, uh, comment on, on, on this. Hi, you briefly mentioned about privatisation of the NHS and as a worker, I do work in finance and I will be part of a trust that will be privatised. So I was, brief, I was kind of wondering what your thoughts would be on how the... <laughs> Sorry. On um, how the short-term and long-term effects of the privatisations of the NHS would be like really impacting not only the workers but those higher up as well. 
the, this contribution will be the last contribution because I think there's quite a lot to sum up on here. <coughs> yeah, just in terms of um, the general Marxist analysis that the de declining rate of profit leads to crisis, I think we've also seen in the last uh, decades basically that the ruling classes around the world have resorted to the Enron, Enron strategy of chiselling, cheating and swindling in terms of uh, just fiddling the figures, um, building up um, fast financial tricks to, to like, cover up the, the, the crisis of profitability in the system. Um, I think the quote from Warren Buffett, I think the full quote is that financial derivatives are weapons, financial, uh, uh, weapons of mass destruction in terms of and from the meeting last week, well, last year, you weren't too keen on Bitcoin as a, an alternative currency. But the strange stuff happening, I think in terms of, I think, I think we can take on board some of the um, criticisms that the Bitcoin people make, such as the financialization of the world economy since America came off the gold standard, the fact that America is 20 trillion in debt, owned to, mostly to the Chinese, so the, the, the consequences of that. And there's all kinds of weird stuff happening. The fact that, I think it's the Bank of Japan, they've got negative interest rates. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, wrong on that. The, the fact, yeah, yeah. So the fact, you know, it's a sign of, of sickness in, in the system that basically they're a bunch of swindling, chisel, you know, basically the cheating. The, the, the whole financial system is a, is a con, fan, um, quantitative easing bails out the banks. Um, the big corporations are just using that. The reason why the stock market's going up, because they can't invest in productive uh, real economy, so it's just going into the bubble of the stock market. The American stock market's almost going private because there have been that many share buy buy buybacks. The system is, um, in, you know, we need to, it's, it's a con, it's a fiddle, it's, 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 it's it's ruining humanity. The eight richest people on the planet, they're the enemies of humanity. Bezos, Zuckerberg, Gates, <laughs> and the five others. So you can fill me in and yeah, get rid of them and we yeah, can attract. The, the Waltons. The Waltons, right. <laughs> we can transform, transform the world into a just world. <laughs> I'm just going to take one quick final contribution. I, in part, I wanted to respond to the comrade who's obviously frustrated about things much more important than potholes, which is, is good. Although there is an argument about why potholes are bad due to cuts in county council funding and austerity, and we need to make that argument. But the other thing is, uh, like other comrades, I don't think any economists should make predictions, but I do want to make one prediction, and I teach economics. And that is, if we don't start taking the piss out of mainstream economists, they will continue to take the piss out of us. That's a prediction. Okay? <laughs> and in fact, it's probably an iron law. And the reason I say this, and, and linked to the comrade's sort of frustration, is for the last six or seven weeks, I've been doing a sort of beginner's bluffer's guide to economics for Unison in the Southwest. This came from a demand at a national union conference that trade unionists want to know more about economics. So I went along, bluffed as most economists do, present company accepted, and took talked about economics, but the interesting thing was, A, over 50% of the people who gave up their time after work at five o'clock were women, and they're not all full-timers or uh, uh, reps, they were just all, some of them are ordinary members, and the main thing I learned was is all they need is partly some confidence to say, this smells like shit, so it probably is shit. And, and these people were, it's all I'd done really was say, follow your gut instinct, you know, there is, there is a lot of crap out there, and have the confidence and the boldness to take these sods on, because most economists do talk shit. In fact, most economists aren't economists. You've got very little training in it, particularly the ones we see on the TV and the ones who give the predictions. So really, all power to the sort of intuition and the anger and frustration that we can take them on. A lot of them don't really know what they're on about, and as Michael has shown, you know, very well today, is, most of them get it wrong most of the time. No, I'll try this. Well, um, let me deal with predictions first because I did make some and we've had several people saying you're an idiot making predictions because you can never get them right and anyway, economists have got everything wrong. Uh, why do you want to join that lot in a way? Well, I, I think I want to try... I'm trying to take Marx's economics a bit further than mainstream economics in trying to judge the direction that the world capitalist economy is going and national capitalist economies are going. And in so doing, it's a bit of a research experiment to try and judge 
all the factors that go together to bring about recessions and recoveries. The basic ones, as we discussed, in my view, the Marxist view, is that the, the law of the tendency of the road to profit default is the key underlying factor of causes of booms and slumps in capitalism. Uh, and that comes to a head with a number of other factors, the level of debt, the ability to pay that debt, uh, all the other financial recklessness that goes on, at least in the last one, and extreme bubbles in different sectors like housing or in the corporate sector in the past. So there's a number of factors involved. But trying to draw out of all those factors, the key underlying ones and the more surface ones, if you like, to make a judgment about where the economy is going. And it's going to be not very accurate, uh, clearly not. Uh, but uh, it's better than doing nothing, in my view. We have to make a, take a view about that direction. We can make a general view. Capitalism always has crises every eight to 10 years. OK, that might be enough. I want to go a little bit further and see if we can judge this more accurately. What sort of period are we in? The book of Great Long Depression argues that we're not in a normal up and down eight to 10 years thing. We're in a long depression. And that this leads to a different situation where the slumps may come to the end. And there's, it may not be enough even one slump to get out of that long depression. Maybe that we, will, we shall see. But that's, that's the attempt that I've made in a series of uh, papers and books to try and... So I do try to make a prediction because I think science is about not just having a theory and having some evidence. Evidence is only justified if a prediction is made and it turns out to be correct. Every time a prediction is wrong, you have to go back and reconsider what you've done wrong. That's, natural science is like that. I don't think that as a scientific socialist, we are much different from doing that process. It's a hell of a sight more difficult with, when we're dealing with the social behavior of people. Um, now, there's so many questions here, it's not going to be possible to answer them all. All I would say is that every single question that has been asked this afternoon has been answered or dealt with in a post on my blog at some time. <laughs> So if you say, what about the productivity puzzle? Why is productivity low? Well, do you know that only a few weeks ago I just did an update on the productivity puzzle on my post, and I'm concerned that the questioners are not reading my blog. <laughs> what about artificial intelligence and robots and the loss of jobs? Well, there is a large section in that book about it. And I must have done at least eight posts on robots, AI, productivity, and profitability, and loss of jobs. And I'm continually considering the question when anything new comes up. Uh, and uh, clearly, it's a ver both of those issues are very important. It's not possible to deal them in, in detail. And they are issues of the modern period, and will be perhaps ways out for capitalism in terms of robots. My view, very simply, is in eight posts. But briefly, AI and robots and other technologies should always exist in capitalism. It's always looking for new technologies to lower the cost of production and reduce the use of uh, human labor power. It's available, but a lot of it is not being applied fully yet and are driving up profitability, prof productivity because profitability is so low. If you can get profitability up, then you'll see a massive increase in the use of these new technologies, which happened in the post-war period in particular, after the Second World War, we had a lot of introduction of new technologies. But we, you can discuss that further and have a look at my post on that. China. Can you explain the whole position of China? Uh, well, no, I can't in five minutes. All I would say is I don't think that the recovery was due to China. China escaped the, ch the crisis for very good reasons, in my view, that it wasn't dominated by the law of value. It was that the state was able to dictate what was going to happen in China. It controlled the banks, it controlled the big companies, it controlled infrastructure investment, it's able to drive through some of the effects of the crash in the Great Recession, but not all of them, because world trade collapsed and China suffered from that. Uh, so, but it's not in a position to raise the whole of global capitalism on its own. It won't be able to do that. Only the advanced countries, particularly America, could change that picture. But if you want more on China, then there are a number of posts on my blog where, where I attempt to deal with that question. Um, imperialism, I think, was a very good question from, from the comrade from Africa because Nigeria, I think, that as he pointed out, in a way, 
the, imperialism, the first imperialist wave was a product of the falling profitability of the major capitalist economies in the, in the depression of the 19th century. As that cover, they looked for new avenues for escape. One of the counteracting factors to, profitabil to low profitability was to the ex export of capital to all the new areas in the world that could be exploited uh, for more labor value and surplus value. And that hasn't been exhausted, in my view. The capitalism still has that avenue for escape Africa is, you might say, the last frontier in this. They've given Asia a good working over. Uh, they've given Latin America a good working over. A in, in a way, Africa, although of course it's been exploited since uh, the last hundred years, this, this is the fastest growing population area in the world. Uh, Nigeria, I don't know, the expansion of Nigeria's population is truly uh, staggering in the next uh, generation. It will be, in terms of population, by far one of the most major uh, countries in the world. This is a tremendous area for exploitation for capitalism if they can achieve it. But at the moment, they're not in a position to really take advantage of this. And in some ways, the state-directed China is doing a better job of getting some of those extractions because it's, it's not tied down by the inability to invest uh, through the multinational companies. And this is going to be an, an important area in the future. The point I'm making here is that capitalism never stays in permanent crisis. The long depression is long, but it can get out of that. It can get out of that by a series of slumps, which creates addition for a higher rate of profitability, and then it can start to expand into, into new areas. If nothing is done by the working class to replace that system, then capitalism will have a new period. In my book, I suggest to you, and it's a frightening thought, that if we don't bring about the, ch the change and the major economies, then capitalism could have a new period of growth. It won't be as good as in the golden age, but it'll be a new period of growth, taking me up to my dotage, when uh, if I'm appearing at the age of 95 here, and we still haven't done anything, uh, then it's because there's been a recovery in the capitalist economy globally as a result of, of the series of slumps which haven't really been changed. Although, who knows? Maybe in such a situation, such as the crisis of, and the anger as one comrade said, such as the levels of inequality, such as the uh, divisions and breaking up of the capitalist economy, that we entered a period of really volatile, even barbaric developments, which aren't a replacement for socialism, aren't socialism, but are a sort of worsening of the capitalist vision. That's always a danger uh, over the next uh, generation. Um, War has been a way out for capitalism, as one comrade mentioned, and you've seen this, both wars, the profitability was driven. Why? Because there was a massive physical destruction of capital in many countries, in Europe uh, and Japan and, and so on. And they, they, so what you have in Europe and Japan was a complete new start. You get a load of new technology financed by American banks uh, and in Japan as well, and a huge labor force they could drag off the land in the case of Japan in the case of Germany, hanging around with nothing to do, massive uh, cheap labor and a dramatic growth. In Britain, it wasn't so good because we, we did uh, able to devalue a lot of civilian capital, but not a, as much. And we had an old uh, technology and a still a relatively uh, small labor force that couldn't be expanded very much. The Americans didn't have destruction of capital, but what they had was a massive devaluation of civil capital and also the complete control over the value of labor power. Workers got wages, but they couldn't spend it. It was all put into war bonds. So in fact, they extracted all the workers' wages and added it to surplus value and got a massive increase in profitability for the military sector. But I make this point. Increases in military spending, say for Iraq or Afghanistan, are actually costs against capitalism. Well, that's not going to solve their problem because they don't get much profit from that and they actually, it's a cost to try and maintain their control. What they want is an outright world war if you want to do that, but the next world war uh, with something that they don't want to contemplate for the risk for that's involved. It's much more likely, in my view, I argue, that we'll see the period of the long, the, the end of the 19th century depression which came to an end after a series of slumps which created profitability and a new expansion into imperialist areas to get out of the crisis rather than a world war, or at least I hope so, because another world war would be catastrophic more than we've any, anything we've seen before. Um, has capitalism's answer to the immediate crisis, as one comrade mentioned, was 
to save the banks and to, to increase credit dramatically through quantitative easing, which was just expanding the money supply as much as they like, keeping interest rates close to zero, bailing out the banks, and generally creating an, a financial boom in the, in the stock market and so on. It's been presented to us as an alternative in the labor movement. That was an absolutely ridiculous thing. What they should have done was expand the money supply, keep interest rates zero, but invest in productive sectors and public services and boost the economy. It's called people's QE. It was actually proposed early on when the uh, Corbyn leadership took over in the labor movement, a people's quantitative easing. And Pettifer also advocates this expansion of the money supply in productive areas to solve the problem. All I would raise about that, first of all, is, is she suggesting that we take over the banks to do that? It's a fundamental question. Are we not going to have public control and ownership of the major five banks and the major financial institutions to carry this through? Or are you simply going to have the Mark Carney and the investment bank decide the people's QE? Because that's the current position. I don't know what Ampediva's position is, but I can't see how you can even start to do this unless we have control of the major banks and financial institutions and public ownership. Well, frankly, that demand in maybe in 1945 would have been okay. In 2018, it's revolutionary. It's revolutionary to take over Barclays, HSBC, what's the other one, Santander, and, all the rest, and bring them into a one organized state banking system to drive money in the direction of productive investment rather than to speculation. That's a revolutionary demand. Let alone the fact if we're just going to expand money supply uh, and hand out money to all the big companies, the water companies, the utility companies, the, the BT and all the other private sector multinational. Here's some money. Can you go and spend it productively, please? Why don't we take them over, too, so that we can have strategic control of investment? In, in, what is this? Why are we just talking about expanding the money supply rather than uh, transforming the position and giving a state control of the major commanding heights of the economy so that not only can we expand the money supply, we can make sure that the investment is productive? These measures sound great, but actually they're an excuse for not solving the problem. 